good afternoon to all of you uh, who've taken the time uh, to be here today for this uh, uh, preview. Okay, so this is not the full program. Uh, it's a virtual learning design masterclass preview. So the full class will actually take you three days. So the intention of today's session is uh, to show you what this uh, three days is going to be and why is this uh, good for you, uh, for those of you who are keen uh, on this. Uh, so this program uh, is, uh, is managed uh, by Gambang Belian, uh, which is the training arm for District College Penang. And we are working uh, uh, in association uh, with uh, Agile Management uh, Consultancy, uh, which is managed by uh, Dr. Sanat Sukumaran, uh, who is the managing partner and who is also uh, the main trainer uh, for this program. Uh, I've known him for a while now, uh, since my previous uh, affiliation uh, right from Taylor's University, but I think I've known him before that, uh, when you were at uh, uh, APIT, APU, uh, before you joined uh, Taylor's uh, in the School of Computing. So Dr. Sanat has uh, 21 years of experience uh, in this field. So he is the right person uh, to, to take you through. Uh, he also comes from a higher education background, so he knows exactly uh, the challenges faced uh, in using uh, virtual learning tools, especially now, uh, since we have moved into uh, uh, more online since uh, COVID. So this uh, session hopefully can give you the outcome that is needed. Uh, if you see from the flyer that was sent out, three main outcome to try to understand uh, the modern learners and how do they learn, uh, what is the optimal attention for modern learners we cannot be conducting the same uh, three hours class or one hour class uh, virtually in the same manner. You will not retain the attention. So how do you use the various tools to, to, to keep the attention? Uh, so that is an important outcome uh, that we need to focus on as we move forward because uh, although we have come out of COVID, uh, there's no turning back. We have already experienced online, students expect online. There must be flexibility in the way how we teach. And hence, uh, this uh, virtual learning is going to be there for a while. So that is why uh, this is something that we are also keen to push on. And uh, so we've got the expert today here to give you the brief uh, overview. So I'm going to hand over the session now to Dr. Sanat to take us through uh, the tools and also to see how important is this uh, as we move forward uh, in this uh, post-pandemic uh, period. Over to you, Dr. Sanat. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. And yes, I've known Prof for a while now, and thank you, and nice to have you and to have me back in this session. Now, thank you for the generous introduction, though. You covered it very well. And yes, this is a preview and a trailer, if you like, you know, just to give you a glimpse of what you can expect to learn in that three days training. So in that three days, you will be taken through quite a few areas and I will give you the faces or the components of what will be done in that three days. Just a quick background of what I do. I, as Prof mentioned, I'm the managing partner of Agile Management Consultancy. We do other things besides just this training. We also do Agile work and that's primarily my core work and we are consultants to the Asian Productivity Organization based in Tokyo. Now in this space, I've been blessed to have been invited for three consecutive years in EduTech Singapore, where I've done work like this, sessions like this for ASEAN trainers, lecturers. And it was very interesting. It was at that point that I built this affinity and understanding and the science behind how do you engage learners. So in this session, uh, the preview session, this session, the next 40 minutes, 45 minutes, I will walk you through some ideas on information overload and how to increase retention. And looking at the idea of delivering concisely, what's that? We'll talk about that. And the notion of cognitive load and optimal attention. I know this sounds a bit of, you know, too jargon to you, but hang on there. I will come to you and talk to you about that. And the last bit is to put all of this together 
to design it. And that's interesting, right? Because, you know, the good thing is this. In the three days training, you will be given a template that you can design your content for engagement. I repeat, you can design your content for engagement and you only do it once. And once you've got that framework, that template, you can repeat that over and over again, lectures after lectures, semester after semester, and you will get optimal engagement. So that's the good thing. So what are we gonna cover really in terms of the outline? We will first talk about the idea of increasing retention. But that's interesting because you, know, you, you can't talk about engagement when people keep forgetting what you taught them, right? So you need to increase retention. And we talk about delivering concisely, you know, not to overload them and understand what their limits are, cognitive overload, and then put all of that together in a planning tool to design that optimal engagement for your learners. And what we're talking about today is actually, in fact, also applicable to face-to-face. -to -face. Now, even though we're talking about virtual instructor-led training, VILT, in actual fact, this is also applicable to the face-to-face -face mode. So which means you're only doing it once, which is applicable for both platforms, whether it's virtual or face-to-face. -face. Now, I wanna start with a quick survey and it's nice to get your views as well, what you think about things. I would like you to pick your mobile device, your handphone, and get on to this link, menti.com. And if you can key in this code, 9297985. And all I need you to do is to put in your response to that. The question is, the question is, according to you, what is the biggest disadvantage, if any? So I'm not gonna bias you for the fact that there is, if there isn't, it's, it's no, but if there are, or there is, what would be your topmost pick compared to face-to-face -to -face learning? So I give you about two minutes. Just get on to your mobile device, click menti.com and type on that code and click your response and submit. Okay, we see some answers coming up. The question is, what is, in your opinion, the biggest disadvantage? So unfortunately, I know some of you may have more than one responses, but the option is only one for you, the biggest. All right, we'll just give another 30 seconds for the remaining few to answer. We've got 22 people in this call, 21 at least to respond. All right, another 15 seconds. For those of you who have just joined us, please head to menti.com and click on the code that you see on your screen.
Okay, so I'm just going to move on. Now, it's interesting we've got this response. Now, I'm going to share with you a similar finding which was done in a larger group of sample size. And this finding reveals very similar viewpoint. There were a lot of people who actually said the lack of interaction being the chief reason of the biggest disadvantage of virtual learning. And that seemed to jive with what most of you have said anyway. We have an overwhelming response on that option as well. Now, what is also interesting, and thank you for your response, that's great. And I'd like to share with you another response, which seemingly states the reverse. Overwhelming number of students were satisfied with the student-teacher interaction during virtual learning. And this seems like, you know, what's that? You know, some studies saying, you know, it's quite bad, you know, there's lack of interaction, there's lack of engagement, and some studies saying students love it. Now, what I can conclude, now we don't know what setting, what dynamics, what context these findings were done, but from my experience, I'll tell you one thing. It all boils down to the design of the content and your lesson. And here I am to share with you what that design element would be and how you can achieve this sort of outcome, a satisfied student with the way you teach. Now, I'm gonna just go through four major aspects of what we're gonna talk about today. And the first one is increasing retention. And remember, we are trying to increase retention because increasing retention is proportionate to learning, right? I mean, how can you learn when learners cannot retain, right? So that is connected. And we want to talk about some scientifically proven strategies. Now I'm going to share with you some strategies. There are three such strategies, and you can easily do this without any effort, even right from tomorrow when you start your next lesson, if you have a lesson tomorrow, of course. So the first one I will talk to you about is value, reinforce, retrieval. Just remember these three keywords. Value, reinforce, retrieval. I'm going to go to the first one now, value. Now remember, always see things from the learner's perspective, never from your perspective. Now just imagine for a while, if I'm the learner, right? And the question is, I'm going to ask this question, why am I learning this? So what? Now, you might feel it's so important for your learner to learn that, but the learner will always ask this question, what for, right? So the first thing I would say is always make it significant from the learner's perspective. I know what we normally do is we start with learning outcome. Guys, we're going to do this. Uh, this is important for you because this is the outcome. It still does not make sense to them. Trust me, it does not make sense to them. It has to be palatable. It has to be relevant. It has to click from their point of view. And that's not very easy. And you notice great teachers have gone to the level of the student to make it relevant for them. Trust me, if you do that, it will click. Now, the other thing you would also want to do is to make it emotionally charged. Now, when I say emotions, I do not mean from the point of view that you're going to cry in all your classes, you know, <laughs> not that. What I'm saying is try to feel deep down that you care for them. And it could also mean that you are sharing some jokes and you are making things so simplified or you walk through them with a storytelling kind of thing and always make it align to the stated and unstated goals. Remember the stated goals are very clear, right? We know we have got the learning outcomes and objectives and so on. But what about the unstated goals? Now that's always often not done. Now, what you could do is that you can always connect to the big picture. Now, how this is going to actually help you in later part of your life and later part of your course that's coming up and how this little information might seem oblivious to you now, but it's actually going to make a difference. Now, trust me, if you do that for them, they will see it. Now, that's value. That's the first one, right? Remember, 
The first strategy is value. The second strategy is, and not to forget, I've got these findings for you. And the research has shown that after one month, up to 88% of valuable learning content was remembered. And the reverse is true. If the learners feel that it is of no use, 89% of non-valuable. Now, when I say non-valuable, it's non-valuable from their point of view, which may in fact be valuable actually. So that's sad because what was supposed to be important was not considered as one because they, they felt it was not important, right? So it's always from the learner's perspective, right? We've got to switch the cards here, see it from their lens. Strategy two, reinforce. That only means, say what you just did and say what you're gonna do. So for, for instance, I might just say now, okay, what we just did was value. And now we're gonna talk about the second technique called reinforce. So I'm repeating it. And the other way of reinforcing is to give a simple practice test, right? For example, if you're doing it over Zoom, you can have a quick poll. Right? What do you think about this? Or you could just ask them to say yes or no on the chat or thumbs up, thumbs down if they don't get it. A simple form of reinforcement activity will go a long way to help your learners retain stuff. And what does research have to say? Learners forgot up to 59% of valuable content in a week without reinforcement. And with reinforcement, it's gone up to 95 to 98%. That's amazing. So how much are you doing to help your learners by just reinforcing? And we'll look at some examples later on. So that's the second strategy. And the third strategy is retrieval. And remember, reinforcement is good when you have some short burst of concepts that you want them to remember. But sometimes reinforcement may not be enough. You might want them to Retrieve, and that is done usually by a form of reflection. Get them into a breakout, have a case study, make them discuss and share with the larger group. So that is an example of retrieval, right? So basically you are getting them to recollect, recollect what has just been taught. So you allow them to do that for themselves. And if you did that, you know, and again, research has shown this. Learners who took five practice tests forgot only 2.3%. And if you only gave them one practice test, they forgot up to 14%. Now look at the ratio, it's huge, it's huge, right? Now in totality, we're looking at three aspects, value, reinforce, and Retrieval. Now, let me recap. We just talked about value, seeing things from the learner's perspective. We said that you should be emotionally charged and see things from both stated and unstated goals. Stated goals, an example I gave you was connect that to the outcome of that lesson. Unstated would be how would that be helpful in upcoming semester, in coming modules, or even in the career that will be the unstated goal, right? So that's value. Reinforce would be repeat information, give them meaningful tasks. And retrieval would be get them to do a larger piece of work, like reflection, a case study, getting to a breakout discussion, presenting their thoughts. So the difference, as you would imagine, reinforce and retrieval, re retrieval could be a larger piece of activity, whereas Reinforce a short burst of activities. Could be a quick poll, yes and no response, and just tell me one thing you remember. They can just key in on the chat box. Those are examples of reinforcing activities. Whereas retrieval activities takes a bit of time. You typically have breakout sessions or get them to do it something on their own. Or you could have a longer quiz, say maybe five, 10 minutes for them to reflect on all that you've done. That could be retrieval, right? Okay, so now that I've covered so much, let's do a little bit of reinforcement activity ourselves. Okay, so I'm gonna pop up a quiz on your screen. 
and if you could answer them you should see a pop up coming up on your screen Two minutes. Let's take another 30 seconds. Okay, so let's end the poll now and see what you've got. All right, so for the first one, yes, what most of you have written up there, correct? Simple task, right? So when you do reinforce, it's always a simple task. Number two, reinforce is done before retrieval, absolutely, because you want, to, you want them to get the concepts right first before getting them, getting them to do the larger piece of work, right? Retrieval is a larger piece of work, whereas reinforcement is little short bursts of activity. So it's true. Number three, showing concern, care, and empathy, absolutely. So that is an aspect of value, right? So you are seeing it from the learner's perspective. So that's really you want value. And number four, which of the following is true? Well, reinforced is best used for quick understanding. That's true. And retrieval is best used for application of concepts. That's true. Um, well, although it says single choice, there's actually more than one answer, right? So the first one is actually correct. Second one, it's actually also correct. So the first two is correct. You should have been given a multi-choice actually, two answers, first two. All right, so you get the point. You get the point where I'm coming from. So in short, what we're saying is value, reinforce and retrieval will go a long way to help you structure your content and your delivery to ensure your learners remember stuff. Remember, if they can walk out of your lesson, being able to say a few things what you've done, you've done a great job, trust me. Because a lot of students will not be able to say even a sentence of what they just learned in a lesson. And we know that for a fact. We've been students ourselves, right? We wonder what we just learned in the lesson that just finished. Um, so try this out, try this out. 
So what we've just done, we've just finished the first bit, increasing retention, right? And we're going to talk about the second part now, which is information overload. Now, that's interesting because you know for a fact, Google handles 5.6 billion searches a day. And you know how many times we click our smartphones in a day? It's 2,617 times according to research. And that all means your messages, right? All the clicks, your words, you type, all of that. It accounts for 2,617 times on average. And our poor brain, guess what? It's working so much. Our brain uses 20% of total calories, although it weighs only 2% of the body weight. And that's interesting. I, it was profound for me when I heard that for the first time. So the question is that, am I a victim of information overload? I'm gonna run through a question, a few questions with you. And if any of these make any sense, I would like you to go onto the chat and just say yes, right? If any of the statements I'm gonna make now ring a bell, then please go to your chat box and just indicate yes, right? Have you had this experience that while you're doing something, like you know, you're typing a report or doing something, and suddenly you, you go on to your WhatsApp and then you check your emails and you go online and check something and serve something? Does that happen quite a lot? Ask yourself. If it's a yes, then go on. Oh, I see quite a few responses there. Thank you so much. Decision fatigue. Have you had this trouble of you know, un you know, being inundated with so much that you cannot make a decision. I mean, you, you, you're having a bit of trouble to make some decisions. Have you had this feeling that, you know, I'm just feeling a bit weighed down, you know, feeling a bit low energy, poor mood? That's something that happens now and then and again? Or is there a situation where you find that you cannot concentrate? You want to concentrate, but you just cannot sit still and focus on something over a period of time because something or the other keeps coming and taking you away from what you want to do. Okay, and thank you for your responses. And overall, do you feel that, you know, your ability to recall sometimes it's a bit stunted? You know, you want to remember something, you know you know it, but you just cannot at the spur moment remember that. If your answer is yes. Okay, I say triple yes. Thank you. <laughs> so absolutely, I mean, I don't think anyone, me included, any one of us can say that there's, there's absolutely at least one yes, if not more. So we are victims of information overload, guys. We are, we definitely are. So the question is, what do we do about it? And what is information overload anyway? Now, in the simplest of terms, I mean, forget about all that mumbo jumbo jargons, right? It's the simplest of terms. It says the input coming into your working memory, which is your mind, is more than what the mind can handle. That's it. So your processor is not able to handle that much. And this is causing a problem, you know? And we call it reduction in cognitive performance. Okay, that's a bit of a statement. And it's true. For all of us in this, call today, I would say information overload is absolutely a real thing. How many times you've gone for presentation, sitting in, just shutting off? We are there, but not there, right? And I've been guilty myself many times. And learners, can you imagine learners coming into our classes? And they're already inundated with so much going on with their other lessons and their family problems. And we come in in our, in our class and we just give them a barrage of information, just so much down to them. Can you imagine how difficult is it for them? So we need to do something, right? We need to help them. And that, that's why the whole discussion about information overload. And I'm going to talk to you about this cognitive load theory. And it was first popularized by this professor from Sydney, Professor Sweller from Sydney. And he said that it's basically the amount of information the working memory can hold at any one time. You know, it's five plus minus two, they say. So it's seven on the upper limit and three on the low limit. Now, typically on an average person, anything more than seven things at a go 
would be beyond their cognitive limit. That means you are stretching them. They will not be able to handle. And you will see the symptoms that we talked about earlier that you said, yes, yes, when it's beyond, they just shut off. And I'm here to tell you today that forget about the upper limit seven. I'm going to propose to you, look at the lower limit three. Number three, look at three. Don't go more than three at the stretch. And I'm going to talk to you about that. How do we do it later on? Learners are distracted. They are distracted. And we cannot tell them, do not use your handphone. I mean, yes, we can have all sort of ground rules, but we just cannot, right? So, which means what I'm saying is their cognitive load is already high to begin with. Forget about our times, right? We had so little distractions, you know, we never had all this stuff that they have now. So I've come to a fact, at least in my sessions, when I do sessions, that we have to accept the fact that learners come to our class already with high cognitive load. So what does it mean for me? Now, I have to curate my content to manage that load because I have no control over them, absolutely no control. So what I can do now is to curate my content and accept the fact that they're coming to my class with already high cognitive load. Now, how do we do that? And that brings me to the next bit, balancing cognitive overload. And there's this very simple formula, and, and I, I've made it very simple for you. You can read loads of article, but this is so simple, and I think you will probably never forget this. Now, there are a few things you can do. The simple way is 415 switch. That means if you're doing a particular topic, if there are subtopics, there are four subtopics, in a 15 minutes burst of time, you should stop and do something else. So which means if you think of a lesson of one hour, your one hour now is decomposed into four parts. Do not see that one hour as one hour anymore. Your one hour has got four parts to it. And in that four parts, you can decompose your lesson into this short 15 minutes burst of activity. And what is that switch I'm gonna to talk to you about? And for example, if I'm gonna do a lesson for a small lesson on marketing, I'm talking about principles and talking about the concepts. And then the switch activity would be breakout. Now, when you do the breakout, what happens is you're managing the cognitive load and then you come back and teach another set of topics they learn better and then stop, switch, discussion. And then stop, switch, quiz. Stop, switch, role play. Stop, switch, storytelling. Do not repeat that because they get bored, right? Your switch activities have to be different, okay? And if some of you are saying, you know, my topic is like, you know, I cannot do it, Sanat. Uh, it's not possible to have it like 30 minutes. I need 20 minutes, okay, fine. So if it's yours is three topics over 20 minutes, that's fine. But my suggestion is do not go at a stretch more than 15 minutes, or sorry, even more than 20 minutes, because you are going to lose them. If you are going to go at a stretch beyond 20 minutes, you are going to lose them, full stop. Full stop, that's it. So if you're gonna have this short burst of activity, 20 minutes, stop, do something. 20 minutes, stop, do something. That's not too bad. Now, my preference is 15. But if you can do it, 20, it's fine. So how do we put all this together? You know, like if we take a typical lesson, you know, a one hour session, you could have 15 minutes block, right? In that 15 minutes, you'll have your little activities. And of course, you could have the switch activity between the 15 minutes. The switch activity could be just a reflection a breakout, like I said, role play, storytelling, go and surf online, get something and share, whatever. So I'm gonna give you some tips how to boost that optimal attention. Let's say you have a 15 minute lesson, right? And you have a first topic, topic one, say it's four minutes. You could have a reinforcement activity. I'll talk to you about what kind of activities you can have. Topic two, maybe four minutes, and topic three, four minutes. So you've got reinforcement activities all the way. 
Now, what kind of reinforcement activities? Now you tell me, Sanat, one minute, what can I do with one minute? It's so short. Trust me, you can. I'll give you a few examples. Just ask them, go to the chat and just tell me what I've just said. Is it okay or not okay? Or just share a joke, a quick joke. I just had this experience. I heard someone saying this. Ask if they have questions. And even if, even if they have no questions, now this is what someone asked me recently. You know, Sanat, our students don't ask me questions. I said, never mind. Because even if there are no questions, you know that silence that you get from that moment you wait until they tell you something, that silence is deafening. I call it the deafening silence because that is where little points gets into their deep conscious. It sticks. Because if we keep blabbering all the time and don't give them time to absorb, they will never learn, will they? And then ask them to insert thumbs up, thumbs down. How long does it take? So you can vary your reinforcement activities, right? Or you can call out someone randomly. That could be a risk if they don't say anything. But if you know someone who can probably stir that conversation, that'd be a good idea. Or launch a quick poll, like what I did. What I did was two minutes, actually. But you could have shorter ones, just one or two, right? Or just have silence. Just say, I'm going to, guys, I'm going to pause for a while, for 30 seconds. I just want you to reflect on what I've just said. Just show them something on the screen. Just think about it. Just 30 seconds. Wow, that's deafening, right? Very powerful. Use these techniques. Um, public speakers, they just go on a pause and they get back the entire attention from the audience. It's so powerful. Use that. And one thing I want to also talk to you about is this idea of delivering concisely. And, you know, a lot of us as trainers, lecturers, you know, we think that we need to give our students a lot. And you know what happens? They get inundated. They get into a cognitive overload. So trust me, from now onwards, what you can do is that there's some content that they can probably do without your explaining anyway, because they're just basic, simple stuff. And do that before the session. And you could have post readings as well. Have that session for you to engage them. Have that session for you to have probing questions, topics which demand that sort of detailed rigor. Do that, right? Trust me, it makes a difference. And I know some people will tell me this, you know, Sanat, our students will not read before coming for class. That may be the case because they are not culturally or rather attuned to the fact that they should be doing such reading. But if you keep getting and harping and nailing them the idea of doing it, trust me, over time they will. It won't happen instantly, but it will take some time. Because you really want that time to be engaging, right? You want the discussion to flow. So that's the idea of delivering concisely. All right, so now my next quiz, another reinforcement activity for us. Okay, only three questions. Let's take about 90 seconds. Okay, another 15 seconds.
Okay, so let's share your answers now. All right, for the first question, yes, that's the idea, right? The second one, most of you have answered that, right? So, well, for those of you who put the third one, um, well, when you say it's a must, that, that becomes a problem, right? Because, you know, some content may be important, but it, it's also best left to you for them to read. And if you're going to have them all mugged in one one hour session, that's where you really get them inundated. They're going to get overwhelmed, trust me. So that's why it's advisable to do number two, to keep that session just for engagement and bare minimum content. It takes time to achieve that, I know. It's not it's easily said than done. Number two, yes, the idea is to have it 15 to 20 minutes. So most of you answered that correctly. Number three, well, the thing is that if you were, some topics are just so simple and I sometimes find that, you know, if they've all got it, the idea is so simple. I may not have a reinforcement activity, although I'm saying you need to have, but it's not always a must, right? So it's not a must that you must have a reinforcement. It depends on the, you know, the rigor, the difficulty level and so on and so forth. And well, Reinforcement activity could just mean asking questions. Yeah, just ask, what do you think about it? That's it, a simple one, right? So the second one, although first number first and second one, both could be correct. Okay, so I'm at my last bit now, the last part, I'm gonna to talk to you about this tool because you know, this session is all about designing for engagement. Now, I'm gonna give you a glimpse of that. Now, the whole idea is that we want to put all that we have learned, right? Whether we're talking about cognitive limit, we're talking about concisely, we're talking about trying to have um, value, reinforce, recall, and everything else. And there's a tool that we will be sharing with all participants on the training day. This tool will be a robust tool for you to plan your entire lesson plan. So if it's a one hour lesson, you can plan for that. And if it's like for me, if I have a three days training for corporate training, I plan my three days using this tool. Now, when I do that, what happens is that I know for a fact that at some point in my lesson, I will be asking them to do something. It's all planned. Remember, we need to plan for engagement. It doesn't just happen. But guess what happens now? When you plan, when you do it over and over again, it becomes part of you. You don't have to refer to this template anymore because you are so accustomed to the style of doing it. You've, you've got it in you. It's part of the way you do it. So over time, you will not need this tool. But for a start, this tool will help you because the principles I'm talking about are all embedded in this tool, right? Which we will talk about when we do the training. So to summarize my session today, I want to start by us talking about this idea of increasing retention value reinforced retrieval, right? To increase retention. And we talked about delivering concisely because we do not want to mug everything in one lesson. We want to have the before and after. And we also talked about the idea of information overload and our learners are already inundated with so much going on, whether in their personal lives, their distraction that's happening with their handphone, their devices, and we've got to make it easier for them and how do we balance it? And that's what we talked about the formula, the 315S or 420S, four meaning your four topics in 20 minutes and then switch, do something else. If it's three topics in 15 minutes and then switch, switch meaning don't just continue with the lecture alone, to change the mode of engagement, could be a breakout, could be a storytelling, could be watching a movie or whatever. And last but not least, all of these things will come together in our design planning tool. So in this uh, the workshop itself, we will get into the details of all of this. I'm just giving you a glimpse of what we're gonna do. In short, we're looking at designing from engagement from four aspects, from the delivery aspect, from the assessment aspect, assessment we have formative and summative assessment, the kind of learning activities we can introduce, the kind of tools we can use 
for the purpose. You know, what kind of technology setup we need, hardware and software. And of course, we have an outline. And what's interesting is in day three, you will be using an example of your existing module and you will apply these principles in what you have already been doing and you will transform your module in day three. So you will see for yourself how these principles will be applied in your very own modules. That's the intention, right? So with that, I would like to conclude my session. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take on questions. Thank you, Dr. Sanat, for giving us a good uh, overview of, of what is expected in this uh, uh, three days uh, full training for, for those interested. We will, we will send out more details uh, with the dates and uh, on the program uh, once we have uh, confirmed the dates when this three day session is going to be held. Um, so I think it, it was a very good overview of what is expected uh, when you are moving into a fully online environment and how do you maintain the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, attention of the students and learnings from the student because it is tough to get the attention of the student to keep them on attention for a long period of time. How do you give the bits pieces to them and reinforce? I think that is really uh, good. Um, so maybe uh, I would like to open the floor uh, to yes, anybody. I will probably uh, start with your question, right? Prof, you, have a, you had a yes, question, yes. I think, on the chat. I will handle that first. Yep. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. You know, sometimes, you know, some topics like math, you, it's very difficult to to break it because you, you really have to finish that much. And only then you can have a little bit of reinforcement or retrieval. But my suggestion is do that first before getting on into some other bits because you will lose them if they have lost at that point. So that's the idea. So yes, your answer is right. Yeah. To switch by getting them to do some applied exercises. Yeah. I think the other challenge that I see is... Uh, uh, because you're giving them bits, like as you said, five minutes with one minute switch or even 15 minutes with switch there. So your program, and then you've already detailed out how you're going to do the reinforcement. But the challenge is always if you have a active class where there's a lot of questions coming in, it will break the flow of your, of your plan because it may run out of time because, uh, of, of course, if you have a quiet class, not a problem, but if you have act active yeah. class, as a as a as a lecturer as a trainer, how do you yeah. handle this to ensure that you are within your your timeline of your of the delivery of your plan? Absolutely. So that's a great problem to have. You know, it's a very good problem to have. Yeah. Uh, very often we don't have that. But that's what I say when I had this session in other groups. I said that do not plan to the level of detail. For example, you have ninety minute session. Do not plan to the minute. Always have a buffer of allowance for such variants to take place. Because otherwise, you know, yeah. it becomes so robotic, right? We go so by the book. Yes. It's, it's never as good as what it should be. Yeah, I get you. Yep. Uh, is there any questions uh, from anyone? You can just uh, unmute yourself and directly ask the question to Dr. Sana. No question. Everyone is... Either well they, are, they are fully understood or I made them very confused. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's the first one. The session was very well handled, Sanath. It's, good. it's very informative and thanks for sharing. Thank you very much, Vanu. I appreciate that. Anyone else? Anyone? Uh, maybe you can even... Uh, share your own experience if you have in, in your class, in running your online class, what are the challenges that you face that you may want to bring it up to see whether uh, the approach that uh, Dr. Sanat have presented today can be used uh, in your own class. Uh, although, yes, we have just done just a preview, not the detail, but then you, you may want to share what challenge you have in your particular subject area that you think it's tough to teach uh, online. Anyone? No one. Maybe Sanad, you want to share. Uh, Sanad, maybe you want to share one of your experience 
um, in the early days when you had uh, you may have have had problems yeah um, I, I, i really have to share this thank, thank you one of asking this you know all this you must be wondering all this information where did it come from because you see in the start of the pandemic you know there was absolutely no business for a lot of companies and that includes the training company that i manage so when in 2021 when i started to get some training proper and i did some sessions with a lot of corporates and i was very blessed to have done some work with companies like philip morris and so on so it was then that i realized that participants were and i was like some of all of us here trying to get them to do a lot get them to learn a lot but i realized that it was not working because the experience was not there you know that i felt that i did a lot of stuff good stuff i'm i'm giving them so much but i realized that they are not learning as much because they only learn when they do it and how do they do it when i keep saying and speaking in all the time they're not doing anything they're just listening to me so i realized things had to change and along the same time the project management institute usa came up with some circular how online trainers should be doing so that was some online classes i took on that space and that augmented a bit of my work early on with edutech asia and i crafted this content i've used it ever since even for my training and i think it's brilliant because you know it's very difficult for you to think on the moment what to do it's very difficult when you're doing your lecture you cannot just think of an engagement activity you got to plan it out yes you can ask very simple questions like what do you think give any questions you know most of us do that right but trust me students are bored they don't like that question if you ask a student do you have any questions they will tell you no questions but if you tell them to do something they will do it like for example you can use menti like what i did earlier menti meter you have a um, um, a word cloud a word cloud so they can keep putting their keywords in the word cloud so exciting you know you see all the words coming up on the screen pop 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 wow you know they they just love it they love it to so do such things that creates a lot of excitement and fun in your session what's the the biggest challenge uh, for online classes is uh, when you have uh, uh, classes that rely on practical uh, practical subjects that require hands on things to do so there's always a challenge uh, how can online delivery assist uh, 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 practical based subject uh, I'll give an example a uh, science based lab session Mm. engineering lab session even even hospitality uh, teaching some practical uh, skills uh, of course you can you can incorporate a lot of uh, videos and demos i think that's the only way you can teach i suppose uh, in, when it comes to very hands on and not very theory based uh, subject area and i would say for those kind of modules prof the instructions have to be very precise because they don't have you to observe your action you know so your instructions have to be really very very good yeah and i had one experience okay. i want to share just one last bit and i did this session with a trainer from india and this was entirely online and i felt from that training that the experience i got was better than what i would have done if i had a face to face session it was that moment that i was convinced that if you design engagement properly and you implement it in the right way it will be very effective so i will end on that note <laughs> ah there's one okay. question actually prof uh, i think nadia question. has a question yeah how if i would like the learners to have a reinforced activity involved more than one example cognitive presentation yeah so that will be a retrieval then nadia so if you want to get on a more detailed discussion and all that would be a retrieval which is good but sometimes what happens is they they may get lost you see before you even get to the discussion question so you might want to have quick retrieval before you get on to the discussion absolutely a good question yeah great uh any more question before we wrap up the session today no okay so uh, so with that i would like to conclude the session 
uh, as I've said, this is only a preview. Um, so please uh, do let uh, your colleagues and uh, any other uh, of your friends know uh, if you think that this session is useful. We will provide you a recording as well for those of you who have come today uh, so that you are able to send this to anyone else who have missed today's session. Uh, uh, Ms. Alina from Gambang Belian Usia, she will also be taking in uh, the uh, inquiries for those of you who are really keen to take uh, the full class. We will let you know uh, when is the full class going to be and what is the cost is going to be to run this class for you to participate. Maybe your institution is going to support you uh, and we will provide you the details uh, as soon as we can. So, so maybe we want to I see a message there. Okay, have a group photo. Yeah, certainly we can do a, a group photo before we end. Maybe you, we yes. want everyone to on their, open their camera yes. so that we yes, can do be a great. snapshot yes. before we end today's session. it be a nice memory. <laughs> okay. Can we, can we get the rest to... Open their camera, if possible. <laughs> if you're in an environment that you can open your camera. Nobody. Okay, yeah, most of us have it on already. Put it hey. on, okay. Yeah, I don't yeah. see. It. So I, I shall take the photo in the count of one, two, and three, yeah? So hang on there. One, two, and three. All right, got it. I'll send you that photo later. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sanat, for the session today. So we will stay in touch uh, to work out the actual date when we can do this session. And in the meanwhile, we will also uh, send out all the information to all the participants uh, who are here. Uh, and hopefully we are able to have this session uh, the soonest uh, as we are all working towards designing uh, our own online classes. So thank you once again uh, to Alina for coordinating this whole event as well today. And uh, we hope to see all of you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.